Welcome to the Go Find Out podcast. I'm Jennifer Jelliff Russell, author, speaker, and entrepreneur, bringing you actionable ideas and interviews with awesome women to help you pursue your dreams and achieve your goals. You can find more episodes of the Go Find Out podcast by visiting gofindoutpodcast.com. Enjoy the show and go find out. Welcome to the Go Find Out podcast, episode number 34. I'm your host, Jennifer Jelliff Russell. On today's show, I interview real estate investment specialist Monica Jazink about her experience of getting into the real estate investment industry and also how she created a company to teach others how to build wealth by investing in real estate. I've also included a personal update today because the world feels like it's getting, oh, I don't know, maybe a little bit hectic right now. (laughs) And I think it's important to know that you're not alone if you're feeling like it's hard to stay focused right now. All right, so let's get to my personal update. Hello, listeners. I hope that the new year is treating you okay so far. It appears that some of the pandemonium from 2020 has leaked into 2021, and it won't be going anywhere anytime soon. You know, when the pandemic first started and New York had its awful outbreak, I was glued to social media all the time, and it took about a month for me to get back into the groove of working again. Then the election happened, and I was once again glued to social media, wondering how things would play out and hanging on to every positive scrap of information that I could find. Then I slowly shifted back into work mode, you know, after a couple of days. Now, however, with the attack on the Capitol, I find myself falling back down that rabbit hole of scrolling and hitting refresh every five minutes. I pretty much gave up on getting much done this past week, and I'm actually recording this the day before it airs, which is not something that I usually do. I also find that when I go down these like social media rabbit holes and news cycle rabbit holes that I I don't get as much quality sleep, and I'm really irritable throughout the rest of the day which is definitely not fun for my husband. It probably doesn't help things that I now have Animal Crossing. And (laughs) I've been playing that in the evening rather than heading back upstairs to the office to knock out some more work. And while I think downtime is important, playing several hours of video games every night isn't getting my books written or edited. It's pretty fun, though. (laughs) Um, And there aren't any politics on my little Animal Crossing island, though it does seem to be a big push for capitalism, which I find amusing. So anyways, um, with, with all of these distractions, I haven't been getting any work done. So something that I'm going to be working on this week and probably in the future weeks is getting back into a routine of creating this podcast and writing, regardless of what's going on in the world. At least that's my plan this upcoming week. And I'm, I'm going to be trying to like set harder deadlines for myself for both this podcast and building content for my Evergrowth Coach podcast, which I haven't launched yet, as well as setting real deadlines for my writing. I'm also focusing on my health more and paying more attention to what I'm eating and drinking. My husband and I are doing a dry January and we're trying to incorporate more salads into our lunches. He's a lot better at it than I am. But like, let's not be crazy. I'm, I'm still definitely going to have the occasional cookie, Oreos, right? Um, <laughs> and eat cereal for dinner occasionally when I'm feeling too lazy to make something. And since I do a lot more running when I have something to actually train toward, I've signed up for the Maine Half Marathon in Portland, Maine, and that will be in October of 2021. So plenty of time to train and get ready. I'm actually eyeing the full marathon, but for now, I'm just signed up for the half. I definitely find that the half marathons are sort of the sweet spot for me since I can still walk and function after them. Um, I'm not so great at that after a full marathon. And actually, one of my previous guests and friend, Insan Lee, she has also signed up for the same half marathon in Portland. And so we might have to do a quick live podcast session that day with her before or maybe after we do the half marathon together. Yay! Anyways, that's what's going on in my world right now. If you're also currently struggling to focus or work as we still push through a, you know, global pandemic and deal with an attempted coup here in the U.S., see if creating a more scheduled process of working with, you know, short glimpses of social media in between projects throughout the day works for you. Personally, I found that I have to work until lunch and then allow myself a glimpse of social media during my lunch break. But then after lunch, I do have to like drag myself away from social media again. So maybe this is not quite the best um, process here. I might go to only looking at social media and the news at the end of my workday instead. But maybe if you have a lot more control than me, working for an hour and then rewarding yourself with a short 15 minute break for social media or whatever might work better for you. I certainly don't have the self-control for that, but maybe try a few different methods to see what works best for you. Okay. Let's get on to the interview with Monica. On today's show, I'll be interviewing real estate investment specialist Monica Jazink about her journey in building passive income through real estate investments. 
She and her husband have also started a real estate investment corporation that helps other investors build wealth through real estate. Welcome to the show, Monica. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm stoked to have you on, and I am very excited to learn a lot more about real estate investment myself. Before we kind of jump into that, can you tell me a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Yeah. So uh, my name is Monica Jasek. Like you said, I'm a real estate investment specialist and a wealth builder. And uh, our purpose of our company, Real Property Investments, is to educate and empower people on the importance of building wealth through real estate and alternative investment products. So I know that kind of sounds like a bit of a mouthful and real estate (laughs) kind of sounds overwhelming and alternative investments sound probably even more foreign and overwhelming to people. But really, there is a really way that people can invest. We're about investing different in a real simple, understandable approach. And we love real estate so much because we feel it's the most comprehensive investment product out there. And we strongly feel that everyone needs real estate investments, whether it's active investments as in owning an actual investment property or even a passive investment, meaning you are learning how to invest in real estate and other people's opportunities. Hmm, Okay. And so now what did you do before starting the real estate investment business? Our journey actually happened and it's very organic how we got into investing in real estate is we we started before starting a real estate investment business as real estate investors and we became real estate investors (laughs) after I was finishing my master's in teaching. Oh, okay. And we were newly married with one small child. And I had to go to the classroom to finish a um, 12 week practicum. Mm. And so I was a student, I was a teacher and I was a new mom. And, you know, that was my really first experience uh, as an adult with trying to do this whole work life balance Mm. thing. I've, I've always created a really great life of freedom for myself before this. And I never had to make a choice in any of these areas. And I realized really quickly that I was selling myself short in all these different areas. And I think a lot of women have this experience. You know, they have the different hats that they have to put on every day. They have their mom hat or home home front hat, as well as um, their work, their working hat. Mm. And it's like carrying on two full-time positions. In this case, it was like three because I was still completing a master's degree, which is a pretty intensive program. Mm -hmm. So I really kind of felt the effects of selling myself short in every area. And I was determined to work through it. And I did work through it, unfortunately, in some areas with average results. And when I'm here to make my mark in this world, I'm not here to be average. Like I'm not here to be an average student or an average mom or an average working person. I want to be hundred percent in these areas. And so I made that choice right then that my number one choice is I really wanted to put my child first and any other kids that uh, come into the picture first before working. I do want to work. I find working fun, interesting, and amazing as I do studying, but I want to be able to create a life for myself where I work around my family so I can put my family to the forefront. That's when I made my decision to be a stay-at-home mom and work around that. And it was great, you know, and and my husband was very supportive in the school and was fantastic. We were very young when we started out too. We were in our 20s. And um, so we didn't really know much about much, (laughs) but we knew we wanted to make this goal and we were determined to make it work. And when we actually ended up becoming homeowners and starting our adult journey, you know, as people with mortgages and financial responsibilities, as well as parents, we realized how tough it is for parents on one salary. I was working part time and that was great and all, but it really kind of made us led to believe to our next eye awakening approach was, wow, yeah, it'd be great to stay at home, make family at the forefront, but it really does take two full-time salaries in Western society today for people to get by. Right. So I, that, this also was a rude awakening because we really were paying attention to the finances. I think women, a lot of them shy away from finances and investments and these types of word, but if you look at any you know, consumer report, you'll see finances, women really actually love it or hate it. You guys are on the front lines. Mm -hmm. Most women are managing the finances for the family. They're paying for the ballet lessons. They're figuring out how much things cost and they're making these budgets. And they say they don't like the investment component about it, but it really is a, a part of everyday life. And I really 
took those finances. I, I was following traditional planning advice and I was trying to help like save the 10% and save for our kids' college tuitions, as well as save for retirement. And it really kind of became apparent that although we were doing things that we were told to do, we weren't getting the results we needed to move forward. And so at that point, it was like this huge eye opener. It was like, okay, Monica, you either go to work full time or you got to start investing different. And that's when I, I had to learn different investment strategies to take the money we did have and grow that money so I can continue on my quest, putting my family first and working around my family. So why real estate? What prompted you guys to focus your investment practices on specifically real estate? So when we started, it was not real estate at all. It was the traditional investments, meaning we had a traditional financial planner. We were doing like the mutual funds and Mm -hmm. this and that um, and those kind of investments and having other people grow our money for us without having a real understanding of it. But when I started looking at the statements, and I'm not a mathematician, but a negative in front of my returns, I knew that wasn't a good thing. Right. Um, <laughs> and then I started averaging out these returns and paying attention to things like projected returns of $40,000, mm. you know, to retire on. That's not going to even last a year. Right. You know, so like I, like, I mean, we had to start doing things differently. And so I started researching different books. And one book that was really impactful for us was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Oh, mm-hmm. I hope you read that book. If not, add it to your, your reader list. It really kind of hones down on why real estate is the number one wealth builder. And it also really kind of challenges traditional financial planning advice. It really shows, you know, what we think our assets are not. They're actually liabilities. And what we think are liabilities really are assets. So it gives that full 180 on financial planning. And my mindset was just turned entirely in regards to wealth. And, you know, it made me take real estate investing and love real estate so, so much because real estate, I really strongly believe is the number one wealth building tool out there as it really allows us to achieve the goals that we wanted to achieve. It allowed us to create the retirement of our dreams. It allowed us to fund four because we have four kids now. It started off with one. Now we have four children and I've been a stay at home mom for over 17 years now. So it allows us to, for me to keep staying at home, but it also allows us to pay for their college tuition as well as help them become owners, as well as create a legacy because isn't that what every family wants? And as I learn more and more about real estate and how to invest in real estate, I really see how everyday people with even one or two investment properties in their portfolio, they could really supersede and overcome a lot of these statistics that affects American people, women, men, everyone, and people all across the globe. And it could really make a difference in their portfolio. And it's not reserved for the millionaires. You know, I really always thought real estate was an asset class reserved for the top 2%, but it's something that everyday people can participate in and start investing like the top 2%. And really start living the life of their dreams. When you guys first got started, really kind of diving into the real estate investment area, what kind of challenges did you guys run into when you first decided to get into it? Well, the number one challenge really was, you know, lack of support. We had Mm. no support system whatsoever. Um, No one that we knew was investing in, in our circle was investing in real estate. But they also were not staying at home with their kids. I mean, they were working full time as they were professional women, all my girlfriends, who chose to go to work for full time. They they felt like, you know, it it's not a popular thing to do. At least this is, you know, almost 17 years ago. Back then, like now people have things have changed a lot. It's more work flex time, working from home, this whole work life balance really, you know, has changed a bit. But back then it's like you actually had to physically go to work and most people worked hard at their careers and they were okay to keep doing that. Mm-hmm. So I was very alone in my journey and as a mother to be a stay at home mom, as well as um, a wealth builder to start building in real estate. And I didn't have the support of my family either, because in our book, Real Estate Mistakes, we actually have a chapter, I think it's chapter one is called The One That Got Away, that details our very first, even before we had kids, you know, our first attempt at getting in this market, I was talked out of it by my parents. My parents had a tendency to talk me out of a, out of a lot of things. Mm. And um, I always needed their approval and I never, ever received that approval. It was very, um, it wasn't, it wasn't there. And so I think a lot of people go through this as well. They want to change their life. They want to create their own life, but from their peers and uh, people around them in their inner circle, 
they really kind of get talked out of doing what they want to do. Mm, yeah. So we wanted to to start this. And one of the challenges was we didn't know how to move forward. We had this book, which had poor dad. We were surrounded by other books, but we had no mentors. We had no community. We had no support. So we actually started a community. Oh, okay. That's how we started Real Property Investments Networking Group. And we started it in our local community and we'd meet with other people and we started growing that circle. And from that circle, we started attracting experts. And I was amazed that experts wanted to speak at these events. So then we started turning from this free, just get together mindset to actually having how to's and experts telling us what to do and turning into a paid event, which then scaled to one of the most long-standing education and events companies out there that's really aimed towards helping everyday people get that real information so they could get started today. Hmm. It's been going on for over 10 years, the Real Property Investments Club that started off as just a free group in one little area has now expanded actually across the globe with branches all across Canada, the United States, and Australia. Wow, that's awesome. When you very first started, obviously, I'm sure you had some fears, but what are the major fears that really kind of stood out to you or stand out to you now that you had then? Well, my major fears are making mistakes. Mm. Uh, and mistakes are inevitable when you're unsupported and you're in the field and you're all alone. It was just losing everything. I felt like I had everything to lose, you know, because I had a family that was counting on me. And my husband and I had no support. We were in this alone just kind of going through a trial and error process. And we were very active investors. Uh, in our first year of investments, I mean, we really kind of ran with this. We did over 100 transactions in all different areas across North America, every strategy under the sun. We were flipping, we were flopping, we were commercial, we were residential, we were land developers. We were doing everything. I was totally not being a stay-at-home mom, full disclaimer. Uh, having kids crawl at your feet while you are on the computer or bringing them to job sites does not constitute as parenting. And I was working 20 hour days and I, I was under this, this, I was actually probably totally acting like a woman, obviously, because I was really running this business and running for it because I was so excited about all this new knowledge and these new skills and building this empire. It was just so exciting and everything I dreamed of. I, I never knew that this even existed, mm. but I kind of abandoned my post. I sort of deceived myself and I was saying I was being a mom and I'm saying I'm home and I'm saying I have this, but you know, like I say, taking your kids to the job site does not constitute as parenting. And this went on for a few years, you know, whereas I put business first before my family and like I, in our book, Real Estate Mistakes, we talk about how we made a million dollars in mistakes, but I don't regret that because that made me an excellent consultant. What I regret was that time I took away from my family. Now, fortunately, they were very, very young at that time. And anyone who, who out there who is a parent or who has kids, I mean, our kids were under, I think they were like eight and, or this started when my oldest was like, what, six or something. And he's almost 17 now. My daughter wasn't even born yet. My, my third was just an infant during this time. So during these times, you know, they were very young. So I think they bounced back great, but kids get busier as they get older. They don't go to school full time and, and there's someone else to take care of. That school, I'm telling you people, they will have you in that classroom if we're allowed to go back to the classroom uh, every single day if they can. And when they get into sports and extracurriculars, I mean, wow, you know. So as they get older, you know, the, seeing how much my kids need me now, thank God we actually actually met someone who really nailed me on it and said, what are you doing? I thought you're supposed to be a stay at home mom. You're a full-time investor over time. You need to hone back and get control over your business. You don't need to be doing so much in real estate to be successful. And that was the same person, which was a coach who taught me how to really create that balance in my life, use real estate as a way to fund our family and get that freedom in our life uh, while still putting my kids first. And that's the message that we really want to help people with because we want people to create their freedom life using real estate as the asset class that helps them get there so they don't have to go in the field alone and make the mistakes we made. And they don't have to take this time away from their family like we did. So we went through a lot to get to the point where we are today. And mm. like I say, the only thing I do regret is the the attention I took away from my family. So now you and your husband also provide information to others about how they can build wealth through real estate investments. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and how that works? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we love to share our experience and 
we love to share kind of what we've been been through. And then we also like to share our true financial freedom story and how we managed to achieve that. Mm. And really with a less is more approach. So the way we kind of help others, like with real estate, we are able to, like I say, allow me to be at home. And now he's at home too, actually, on his 40th birthday, he was able to walk in and retire. Oh, nice. Um, on a, That was his goal. We made that when we were, you know, in our, when we first started out, you know, he's like, in five years, I want to I want to retire from my job as well. And it was a huge process. We actually just wrote another book, Employee to Entrepreneur, that really kind of outlines how people can achieve this if this is what you want. Because a lot of people in this day and age, they don't stick with the same jobs. You know, they develop passions or they want to turn their passions into a business. And, you know, but you, you still have these adult responsibilities. You still have these goals that you have to, you know, achieve. So Employed Entrepreneur really kind of walks people sort of through that. So that's what we really kind of want to help people achieve is show them how we got that financial freedom in our life and how they could take the same kind of strategies in regards to real estate, but apply it to them. Not try to get our goals, mm-hmm. but what are the goals that, you want to achieve. So if you, Jennifer, were to come to me and be like, you know what, I want to um, achieve freedom in my life. My goal is to, I want to be able to help my kids out, fund their college education. We would advise on some investment opportunities that actually exist and educate you on those opportunities that are available and show you exactly Well, if you wanted to participate in an opportunity like this, it's going to cost this. The purchase price is this. So you'll have to be able to qualify for a mortgage like this. Mm -hmm. But the return on investment is going to be this. You're going to have this amount of cash in your pocket every month. And in five years, you're able to either sell this property and and you'll have X amount, which could fund the school, or maybe you could refinance. And here's all the experts available to you, Jennifer, to help you move forward. So otherwise, it would be Jennifer and a book trying to figure out what do I want to achieve? (laughs) Am I doing the right thing? What professionals do I use? What areas do I invest in? You know, I don't want to be an active investor. What are my options there? And this is where people, they feel really unsupported and alone. We kind of really provide these turnkey solutions for people. So they're able to actually grow their money. And we also have the education and information so they understand what they're doing. I think a lot of people need more understanding of finances and financial planning and not the traditional way, but these, the real estate way. And there's so much cool information out there. And we have these top experts presenting every month at events and everything's online now. And we're having like five different topics a month going, circulating in perpetuity here to help as many people as possible on really, really important topics about real estate, investing and wealth building. So when people listen, it's in layman's terms, so they can actually understand how it applies to them and they can actually, you know, decide, hmm, is this for me? Right. I think there's definitely not myths, but some misunderstandings out there about real estate, or there's just, like you said, maybe not enough information out there about it. And in my mind, real estate investment is primarily you buy a house and you rent it to somebody, right? But obviously there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more options, it sounds like, than that. There are a lot of different options for real estate. It depends on what you want to achieve, and we help you align them to your goals. We have a webinar recently put out called Your Three Biggest Money Problems Solved. The one problem is 80% of American people are not making enough money. We have um, a certain amount are living paycheck to paycheck, and some people are not even making enough money. They are actually just like really living on their credit cards as well because they're simply not making enough. And this is a legitimate problem that, that occurs over the world is a lot of people are not making enough money. Um, and these are professional people who've done everything the right way. They went to school, they go to uni- like college and universities and their professions and their job, and they're still not making enough money. People need to recognize when they're not making enough money. And there's certain real estate strategies that people can participate in, like say flipping homes, for example, that can help you make an extra $100,000 a year. We could break it down that simple. How would you like to flip a home every quarter and profit $25,000 a quarter? We have that information to show you how to do that yourself in a systematic manner. Or if you're just way too scared, there are ways people can participate in these types of opportunities 
We have professionals that are huge companies that are doing this day in and day out, and people can participate hands-free. So basically, they're an equity partner, and it's all done for them. So while they're going to work, and they're with their kids, and with their family, this is an example of a way that can be income-producing for them. Now, people can also get cash flow every month from buy rent and hold properties, and that's amazing. But one of the myths, and you just mentioned there must be a lot of myths, Mm -hmm. is that real estate is you can actually need 100 properties basically to retire off that amount. And off the cash flow of buy, rent, hold, a lot of the time it's not that great. I have to tell you, it's great for long-term growth. If you want to send your kids to college, the appreciation from that investment and the total return on investment is going to give you a huge chunk that can help you retire that can help you pay for your kid's college education, that can help pull out $150,000. And here you go. Here's your down payment for your house, for your family. That's fantastic. But sometimes, since we only focus on high growth areas, we don't chase cash flow. That's a huge mistake investors make. Oh, I'm going to get this cheap, cheap home and rent it out for a lot of money. And I'm going to be getting so much cash flow every month that I'm going to leave my job. It doesn't really work that way. There's ways that you can get it to work, like maybe the burst strategy, but realistically speaking, turnkey buy, rent, hold, the cash on cash return is not the only component of the return on investment. Some of our models, you're only getting $100 a month, $300 a month. That's fantastic. And this is cash in pocket after everything's paid for, including all your contingencies. But it's really with buy, rent, hold real estate, it's the long-term growth. That's the true benefit for that. Whereas the flip strategy, or if people want to participate in a rent-to-own strategy, or there's different types of strategies that they can actually invest for cash flow, if that's what the problem, it's a totally different type of investing. And then there's even just self-directing. A lot of people don't know you could self-direct your IRA. They think you have to invest with the banks or with your company group fund or all these things. And these returns are producing very, very pitiful results, unfortunately. And this is why a lot of Americans can't afford to retire. Do you feel like you have any specific habits that have made you successful in this field? Yes, I have specific habits. And that's another thing that we provide on our on our member site as well is as a wealth builder, the number one change of wealth is for you to invest in yourself. And we say the more you learn, the more you earn. So that's why we have very low cost ways that people could have access to these events, to this information so they can grow their minds because you want to grow your mindset is the first investment to wealth. Wealthy people do things differently and you have to start doing things like the top 2%. So it all starts with mindset. No one has ever gotten rich off savings. A lot of people, traditional financial places, save, 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 save. No one has ever gotten rich off saving their money. And the way when people hoard money, that's horrible for your mindset. You have to be investing it in yourself and learning about it and knowing how to keep your money in motion. Because when your money is not in motion, you are losing money. Your money erodes in value Mm -hmm. when it's sitting still. Right. Isn't inflation higher than the percentage rate back? It is. People are pretty much growing their money at zero. And I'm probably getting negative returns with traditional types of savings. So let's look at someone who takes traditional financial planning advice and they're saving 10% every month. And they're just putting it into an interest bearing savings account. And if this savings account is making 1% and the the inflation is 1.75%, you're now at a negative return. Let's pretend they're a little more aggressive. They want to go with traditional mutual funds with your typical financial advisor. And these aren't people who are paying attention and actively growing. This is who I was. I was the set it and forget it gal. Yep. Because finances (laughs) were above me. I didn't know this. This Let's let's just take, give it to my financial planner. Mm -hmm. You save the day. Well, I lost track of my financial planner after that. All I'm getting out of these statements. And if you look at the typical returns from these kind of set it and forget it models, you're at about 5%. 5% is not a bad return, but when you minus the management expense ratios, which are 2.5%, and the ma- minus inflation upon that, most Americans are growing their money at around 1%. The biggest risk everyone can take is to continue to do things the traditional way. With real estate and our investment models, our total ROI, and a lot of people are going, why does she keep saying ROI? What is ROI? It's your return on investment. That is something that everyone needs to know. 
and how to calculate. It's a very, very simple equation. If people could take the time to figure out how to use TikTok, I'm sure you could jump online and figure out how to use basic ROI. It's all basic math. That is so easily understandable. But the return on investment of real estate, our real estate models are averaging between, these are active real estate models, 26 to 48%. So if that's confusing to anyone, imagine getting a return on investment that's 28 to 48% versus 1%, which is what most people are getting now. Now with passive investment models and self-directing, it's not 38 or 40% or whatever. It depends. Each one of those models have different returns and there's return components. And you have professionals who can guide you in this, but you also can learn the basics of self-directing as well. You could learn what makes a good investment. I want to choose where my money goes. With mutual funds, it just kind of goes everywhere. You have no control. You have no control over what's going to happen. You have no control over the markets. But with these other self-directing products, you could take it upon yourself. There's a lot of great investors out there who have very legitimate and proven real estate models, and they have structured funds with licensed professionals out there ready to help you grow your money. But you can actually be an active participant. You could be like, wow, this is really cool. Like, I didn't know I could take my you know, IRA and not just have to give it to the bank. I didn't know I could invest in apartment buildings where I can actually talk to the director of this fund and learn this model, like of how this works, or I could actually be part of a land development. I could be part of a self-storage facility, but I get to pick where it goes and I can operate in a full understanding of how my money is working for me. And I can decide where I want my money to go. I can decide how to mitigate my risk. I'm not a sitting duck watching a computer screen and the markets crash and I go down with that. With real estate, you have a lot of control over your investments. That's why I love real estate so, so much. The fact that you could leverage your investment and the fact that you have so much control over your investment. You can go into real estate, whether they're uh, passive investments or active investments, meaning an actual property, and plan for any risk factor that may or may not happen in the future, rather than just handing your money over blindly and having that hope and prayer strategy that so many Americans go on. I hope one day I'll be able to retire. I hope that my I'll have enough in this account that my kids will be able to go to school. I hope that I don't lose my job because I'm living paycheck to paycheck and I'm not creating that extra income. That's a very stressful way to live your life, which is why most Americans, they live to work. They're too scared to stop working. And a true indicator of your wealth is how much money are you making when you're not working, when you're not trading your time for money. And COVID-19 was huge for that. A lot of people all of a sudden couldn't go to work. That working money is gone. Now what do you do? The need to create residual income and whether it's through, and wealth building is a lot more than just real estate. Real estate is the number one asset class to get you there. The wealth building is the mind, the ideas, and knowing how to understand money and how to make money. There are so many ways people need residual income coming in. It's through the form of investments, also through the form of a business. Never has been, there been a better time for people to take their passions, their hobbies, and their interests and start creating residual income in addition to their working income. Jobs are great people. Jobs are fantastic. They let you qualify for mortgages. They'll be your primary income coming in. But what about having this emergency kind of plan in the background working for you? So if COVID all of a sudden cuts you off, you might have another business going on where say you're an online marketer and you do something you really love. There's a lot of great, if you're not a natural entrepreneur, there are so many different business in a box kind of companies out there. I mean, we started our business from the ground up. Believe me, that's a full-time gig. And if anyone who is interested in doing that, it'll be the most worthwhile thing that you will ever have done. You could do that into addition to a job and eventually replace your job. But for those of you who feel like I'm not a business person, I don't have the time or energy, I don't have the financial startup to go into it, or I don't want to feel like risking that. How many, like, honestly, Jennifer, how many MLM companies can you think out there that would resonate with an interest of you where you're able to kind of go in there and you have a business in a box pretty much ready to go for you and you get all the training and support required? What advice do you have for other women out there? And I know you've, you've provided a lot of information today and there's so much advice that you could probably give. So if you had to narrow it down to one piece of advice that you would give to other women out there who are interested in building wealth through real estate, what would you, what would you say that is right now? I would say women, if you are not making money a priority right now uh, and learning about it, do not ever 
a lot of women that we have at our events, they come in with their husbands, which is great. I think most of our couples are married couples. It's just a lot of the time, men are mainly in this industry. And also they're the ones that are taking control of the finance. And when I work with couples, I always insist that the couple is there and make the wife listen as well. And sometimes, yeah, we have some women who are running the show. Like I'm in charge of all the finances in our family, as well as lead our business because I was home and I had the time to do it. And so naturally I kind of delved right into it. So I don't think that finance and money is a gender thing. Parenting is a gender thing. I think everyone, the strongest couple is interchangeable. But if you're alone, obviously you have no choice. You're already doing the money. Let's up the ante and start creating that plan for yourself. Even if you're with someone in a secure relationship with 55% divorce rates and widowry rates on the rise. And a lot of women, like I said, choosing not to marry, having kids on their own. It's great. Let's get empowered as women, but you need money. Just like everyone else, you need money. And we need to take finances, put it to the forefront. And if you ever catch yourself saying, oh, my husband handles that. I remember one of my friends actually said that to me. She said, oh, my husband makes me rich. And I looked at her and I said, that's the scariest thing I've ever heard in my life. (laughs) It's a horrible way to think. No one makes you rich, but you, and this isn't brain surgery and it's not reinventing the wheel. It's just taking the time to learn a couple concepts and please do not say numbers are over my head or I get confused or you get that glaze. It can be easy. It can be interesting. Everyone needs to take time to learn basic finance and make it part of their everyday life because we're so involved with money as it is. No matter how many people say it's not for them, it already is. You're already doing it. So why not work towards controlling it, understanding it, and making more of it to live the life of your dreams? Gotcha. And where can listeners learn more about you and your company? Well, we are all on social media. If you click on our, as you can see below on the tags, you can see our website at realproperty-investments.com and as well as Instagram, Facebook, and we have a lot of great content on our Real Property Investments YouTube channel. Oh, nice. And you guys are actually offering a 30-day free trial right now, right? We are. We are. If you click on our website, um, up will pop a free trial link, which helps introduce people to the real property investments community. If you go to the website and you click on services, you're going to see we have different types of coaching and all the prices are there. And we do this because we are really are a no-guff company. When we say we're real, we are real to the core because we're sharing real people, our real experiences, but our prices are very, very helpful towards other real people. A lot of real estate education is the cost of a down payment on a house. And we have tons of courses and information. Uh, The members always get discounts, but everything's always priced so you guys can actually afford it. Because I want you to be able to keep joining us and investing in yourself in a low cost way that's gonna maximize this freedom and finance in your life but something that you're excited to be part of. And it's not like, oh, it's a financial, another thing I have to budget for or account for. So we want you guys to be into it and invested, but all the prices are there because I hate it when someone says, oh, it's by appointment only and you get the salesperson on the phone and they close you. And I don't feel that's very empowering to be sold to. We want you guys to make this as an investment. This is part of your life, part of your journey. And we respect the fact that there's a lot of information out there. And the free 30-day trial really lets you come in for free and really check us out. See if you like us. Because if you don't like your mentor, you probably shouldn't be learning from your mentor. Right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today, Monica. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great conversation. Hope that you enjoyed this interview with Monica. Several of the things that Monica said in this interview really resonated with me. But one thing that I really wanted to focus on was when she talked about how when she and her husband first started investing in real estate, there wasn't really a community that they could turn to for advice. And rather than give up or getting discouraged by that, they instead started their own community, which is now thriving today. I think that this is a really important point. For most of us, there's usually a community already out there for the thing that we're pursuing, right? And I've talked before how if you can't find a community in your local area where you can meet up with people in person, that you should definitely look around online to see if, you know, there are Facebook groups or podcasts out there or YouTube channels out there for the thing that you're pursuing. 
For me, looking online for a group has been a tremendous help for my writing, as really there aren't any in-person groups near me who talk about growing as an indie author or, you know, how to build an author business. But once I shifted my focus to online groups, I found a huge community that has been really helpful. However, those Facebook groups weren't always around, nor were the indie author podcasts. When I first self-published in 2012, I really couldn't find almost anyone talking about self-publishing. And when an immediate community didn't pop up in Google searches, I just stopped looking. I got discouraged. And I eventually stepped back from self-publishing for a bit. If I had instead taken a different perspective on the situation, I could have seen it as an opportunity to build a community, you know, online or in person, for other indie authors like myself. My point is, if the goal or dream that you're chasing after doesn't have some sort of existing community or group where you can find support, take a page out of Monica's book and try building a community for yourself. It may take a little time for other like-minded souls to find you, but eventually they will and then you'll have your own community. If you build it, they will come, right? So don't let a lack of community hold you back from pushing forward toward your goals like I did. So the second thing that I wanted to touch on during Monica's interview was something that I initially really balked at, which was about how MLM or multi-level marketing can be the right fit for some people as a business. I am not a fan of multi-level marketing. <laughs> um, I do feel that they, they aren't usually much more than a pyramid scheme. And if you sign up to be part of an MLM, it might be touted as you having your own business. But at the heart of it, as one of my previous guests, Yolanda Russell, mentioned in episode 21, you're not ever really in charge in an MLM, right? You're sort of your own boss, but you always have the actual company over you telling you, you know, what to price the product at, and they can change those prices whenever they want. So changes can happen overnight without your consent in an MLM. And so while I'm still not a fan of multi-level marketing, I will say that after thinking about what Monica said in this interview, I do have to agree that if you've never owned a business, that starting out in a MLM or multi-level marketing kind of business and using that experience to learn how to market and build a brand presence online could definitely be worth it. It's a bit less daunting to put yourself out there if you know there's an entire company backing your efforts and that there's a community of other people doing the same exact thing as you are for that company. It might be less scary going from that to starting your own business. So I can see the merit of getting involved in an MLM, though, full disclosure, still not a huge fan of them. <laughs> One last thing that really resonated with me from Monica's interview was when she talked about how she got some negative pushback from her parents when she and her husband expressed their plan to start investing in real estate. I think that this is a really common occurrence. I know I still default to asking my parents for advice or wanting their feedback on something. And I've definitely leaned heavily on their advice in the past when making some really big decisions like buying a house or determining what major to focus on in college. And looking back on those times when I chose to heed their cautions about not pursuing something that I was passionate about, hello English major, um, I find that I do regret not having followed my passion. Sure, by following their advice, I did find more immediate stability financially. But in the long run, not following my passion meant I deferred my own dreams out of fear of failure. And not my own fear of failure, but by listening to and then embodying their fear of my failure. And I know that this is, you know, out of love that they do this and, you know, out of a sense of wanting to be protective, right? But it still can be kind of limiting if you buy into it and make choices based on somebody else's fears. So I used to be really annoyed by this fear reaction from my parents, but I recently noticed it in myself when my husband told me that he wants to start signing up for 100 miler or even longer races. My initial reaction is one of fear. You're not ready for that. You could get hurt, right? And I could tell that those reactions were really hurting our relationship and his willingness to share his dreams and goals with me. The thing is, I know he can do these things. He's just one of those people who sets his sights on a physical goal and then does it. I am not that way, listeners. <laughs> I, I have to have a plan all laid out for me in order to truly believe that I can accomplish a physical goal like that. And I've totally been projecting my self-limiting beliefs onto him. So I've been working on shifting my response. Instead of automatically asking if he thinks he could be ready for a race that he tells me about, I'm focusing on telling him that I know he can do it. Then asking questions about what he'll need to do to get ready. So instead of me saying, are you sure you can be ready for that race in time? I've shifted to something like, that sounds pretty cool. Literally, running in the Arctic sounds cold. <laughs> so we should probably look for some cold weather gear for that together. Right, so making it a more positive response. 
I'm always going to be a worry wart, you guys, but there's no reason that I need to project that worry onto him and potentially keep him from going after his goals. If you have someone in your life who tends to have a fear reaction to you stating your dreams, see how you can use their fears to shore up your dream instead of crushing it. Or maybe like me, you found that you're the person who has that automatic fear reaction for someone else stating their dreams. Dig into that to see what's going on there and see if you can reframe your response to be more supportive. Okay, listeners, this was a really lengthy episode today. (laughs) Apparently, not talking to people in person for all these months during the pandemic is making me quite chatty on here. Um, I'll try to reel it in a little bit next time. I hope that you enjoyed today's interview with Monica. Join me next week for a solo episode in which I dive into two fears that are not often talked about, the fear of mediocrity and the fear of quitting, which I call the fear of deflation. Until then, go find out. Thanks for listening to the show today. I hope you found the information beneficial and that it helps you tackle your own Go Find Out goals. You can find more episodes and the show transcripts at gofindoutpodcast.com. You can also let me know what you thought of the show by tweeting me at GFO Podcast or follow me on Instagram at GoFindOutPodcast. That's it for today. Now go find out.